That goes way back. Um, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in a place of very diverse music, diverse, diverse racially, diverse socially and culturally. But, you know, at the same time, it was also a place of conflict and segregation. And so I grew up being just a huge fan of music and a devoted listener to music. And very early on, seeing the contrast between you know, like that phrase, you know, why does everybody love black music but not black people? Seeing that very early on as a, as a child in, in the, the environment, um, you know, I grew up in, in Riverside. And so being really invested in music and being part of a music scene, the ska punk scene in Riverside, that was very multiracial. It kind of has roots in the two-tone movement um, in England. And just being a group that was really invested in using music to challenge, right, this would be the early 90s, right, post the uprisings in LA. I graduated in, in the spring of 1992 from high school. Um, a lot was going on and music was our way to challenge that. And so both, I kind of felt like I was raised in this sense of, of optimism that, and power that music has through bands like Fishbone. And, um, but then at the same time, it was also a scene that there was lots of challenges and fights and neo-Nazis trying to, to, to squash what was happening. And, and so like music, it held so much, but at the same time, I also saw the, the limitations of that. And coming out of that, I then um, taught high school for six years and was part of really thinking about the classroom space really differently and how the classroom space became as much about silencing students as it was about empowering them. And you know, it's kind of like all these different experiences in my life kind of led up to then like going to graduate school. I went to graduate school after one of my high school students, Taisha Miller, was killed by police in, in Riverside the same year as the um, ex-boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend's cousin that I grew up with was also shot by the police. And having, having those two traumatic events happen so close together, having them happen at all, really just, you know, again, challenged my whole way of thinking that, that, music, that music has such power to bring us together, but, but there's people not hearing, people not hearing it, and the consequence of, of not hearing can be, can be deadly. And so that really wanted me to, I wanted to get in a place where I could ask questions in a different way where I could be able to change some of the things that I saw happening in my classroom, in my school, in the educational system, and, and going to USC seemed like the way to, to be able to get at some of, those, some of those questions. So yeah, so it's a mix of life experience and loving music really deeply and just growing up where I did and when I did. It gives us a whole new access to their brilliance and the depth of their brilliance in ways that have been, they've been shortchanged in terms of how we remember their work. Um, and, you know, something like the field of sound studies, for instance, a lot of scholars, or sound art, a lot of scholars look at it as if it started with John Cage in the 50s or Murray Schaefer in the 70s. And part of what I do in the book is say, no, you know, black, black artists, black performers, black people have been thinking about sound in these deeply epistemological, theoretical, and profound ways. They have done it in different venues than scholarly publishing and, um, you know, du, Bo du Bois would have if he could have, if he wasn't prevented from having tenure, if his work wasn't bought by the government and then shelved. That's why he became a novelist. That's why he wrote The Souls of Black Folk, because his academic work was suppressed. And that was, he invented a whole new language and form to be able to, to share the, the research that he was doing. So thinking about the way in which they use sound expressively, the way in which they f use it as a mode of thinking and understanding the world is, you know, it's been there all along. It's only our 
the way that we're we're taught to to speak and listen, and the to, you know what the kind of structures we're taught to um, expect brilliance in um, have have cut cut that aspect of their work and thinking off. So. When I teach my students about double voicedness, I'm like, well, that is, that is, that sound is part of the double voicedness. It's a whole conversation that when we only talk about visual imagery, when we only talk about text as, as silence, and we only talk about language in terms of, in terms of um, content or meaning, um, we're, we're really squelching that whole, that whole conversation. I think that you know one of the most interesting conversations I've been having in my class this um, this year actually was about the toppling of the Confederate monuments. So we were talking about both why the rally was held at the Thomas Jefferson Monument, but also we, we raised the question about what do these monuments do to the soundscape? How can we look at sound and listening? What relations of of hearing and listening do these sculptures enact and you know we're you know kind of the argument is like oh you know they've been there they've always been there they're historical right it's from this very kind of white perspective that either they're just wallpaper that nobody should worry about you just walk past them or they are um, historical um, or of course that some folks you know actually revere the things that they the, the things that they've done but you know, in thinking about these statues as, you know, continuously setting the conditions that we relate to each other. What does it mean to have a Confederate general standing outside of a courthouse? What what does that suggest about how you will be heard if you are a black person in this community? Knowing that on the statue it says that this is this is um, this is in Durham that the you know this is donated by the community. Um, and the way that, that those, those feelings are, are still very present and still um, very much about the feelings of now. And so we had a really interesting conversation. Nobody, you know, we talk about them visually, but nobody really thinks about the rather kind of chilling effects on sound and listening that, that these very kind of silent visual things actually have and how the removal of that can have such a profound impact on what can happen in that space and how you can imagine yourself being. So I really think that sound offers a really important mode of understanding our relationships to each other. That we assume that because there are people, like back to California, we assume because there are people of different races in a space, you take a photo and call it diversity. Um, what sound will offer is an actual feeling of whether or not that space is shared. Who's whose priorities and, and sensory orientations are, are taken for, you know, taken for normal in terms of what kind of, um, are you, you know, is it a space where you have to use standard speech? You have to think about whether or not your accent will be something that will bring violence upon you, whether it's something that will be thought of as not as smart, if it is something that will be exoticized. Um, all of those things are sonic relations. The picture of diversity, the visual picture of diversity, doesn't tell us much about the actual feeling and use of the space or the actual social relations. And that's what I think that thinking about the sonic color line and thinking about sound offers us, and it actually can allow us to work toward achieving real equity in space and not just a nice picture in a, in a university catalog. What is intriguing about Black Panther is the sense, I mean, there's many things that are intriguing about Black Panther, but one of the things I've been thinking about is, right, um, the calling into being sonically and visually an uncolonized Africa and thinking about how that might sound. I mean, in some ways it's like without this external sonic color line imposed, what would that sound like? What would that feel like? And, you know, maybe even thinking about, um, you know, again, these, these spaces and very early hip hop when it was limited to the Bronx neighborhood and thinking about sound as a way to imagine a space that is uncolonized in that way and a space where um, you can 
leave the sonic color line at the door. Um, and, and really, there may be something to think about in terms of how the, how the sound designers were trying to create that feeling um, through sound. You know, I have spent a very long time studying subjection, actually because I found that the language, celebratory language, especially about music, was too easy. Um, and like I said, I've seen from the inside of a music scene that looks celebratory from the outside, but had some really, really, you know, dire challenges within it. And, and those negotiations were really important. So I wanted to temper the kind of idea that, you know, we could throw a big concert and it, and it solves everything. But at the same time, the reason why we have things like the sonic color line is because music is very powerful, because these modes of auditory culture do literally reach out and touch us vibrationally. They do bring us together in these particular ways. And so, you know, the sonic color line works to, to contain that power. So my next project, I'm actually exploring black women and Latinas and their record collecting and the way that we often don't think about women as record collectors. You know, again, that's because of the way academia and popular culture has treated a collection, you know, that you have to have 60,000 records all in plastic covers, you know, these very kind of stereotypically white male, middle class ways of treating objects. Um, but I'm looking at, you know, I started looking at Africa Bambata and early hip hop DJs and going, well, these, these are the folks who are breaking the sonic color line. These are the folks that are really using sound, not just to create a thing, right? Capitalism kind of turns music into a thing, but they are actually transmitting how they listen to the world. And then I'm like, well, where did they, you know, where did they learn how to listen this way? And then that's when I took it a step back. I was in the archive at Cornell and the archivist Ben Ortiz goes, hey, you know, these records belong to Africa Bambada's mother. And I was like, I didn't know that. They did? You know, what's her name? And he goes, I don't know. And I was like, how do you guys, you're the archivist. How do you not know her name? And so then I went on a, went on a mission to, to find out who she was. And then I started looking up. I'm like, wait, Grandmaster Flash listened to records with his mom too. Cole Herc's mom sent records to Jamaica from New York when she was up there working. And that, you know, playing records for your children, playing records in the home was where, you know, this thing called hip hop, the listening practice that became hip hop started. And so my next work will be interviewing women about their record collections and how and why, um, how and why they kept them, played the records that they did. What was it like to play records at home for their, for their kids? What records do they still have? We can trace some of these, these samples, so many Aretha Franklin records in their collections. You can trace the samples in the songs that were created. So my next project is, is focusing on that and how the sonic color line is challenged through music, not just um, a force of limitation. One of the things I think that the Sonic Color Line does for media studies, or I'd like it to see happen, is this conversation about, is adding to the conversation about race and technology and really thinking about, you know, I think about my radio, the chapter I have on radio as, as an example of this kind of work where we are very comfortable with the kinds of periodizations of, right, things like the, the golden age of radio and, um, you know, and you have scholars like Inez Casillas challenging that and saying, well, why are we calling it that, right? We have um, more people listening to radio stations now, but they're Spanish language stations, right? So um, is this about the English language? Is it about the format? And what my chapter does is says, how can we talk about this as the golden age of radio without also considering this as what hopefully was the apex of segregation in the U.S. What does it mean to call something the golden age of radio when there were so many real limitations as to who can perform, what kinds of sounds were allowed, what the representation of blackness was, was like? Is this a way to um, 
you know, and, and that got me thinking actually about sound as and radio as an instrument of segregation, that it didn't just passively reflect the times, but it actively constructed um, what a segregated America sounded like. And the way that we really look at radio audiences still as almost predominantly white, even though about 90% of American households in the 40s had a radio, where are there representations of black radio listeners? Where And kind of doing that archival work and also doing that theoretical work to really think about listeners and to really also think about the, the way in which technology is racialized um, and, and the kind of structures that support it are racialized. So I really want to consider that. Um, I also think the spaces of reception and actually thinking about space, like in general, in sound studies and media studies, I think now um, we're all, we're moving toward conceiving of, of, of space and how, how space is racialized. And I think my book goes a long way toward getting us to, getting us to think and, and consider how we produce space and how we share space and how we perceive power dynamics in space in ways that are not seen, not spoken, but are felt and heard. And I think that, that that's really crucial.